Not I, but Christ, right? It is Christ. I don't have any special love for people. It is Christ in me. And as I spend more time alone with the Lord, beholding the Lord, the glory of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18, one of my favorite verses. Um, but we all, with unveiled faces, right? The Jews that are lost, still unconverted, they're veiled with the law. And that applies to so many people. They're trying to work their way to God. But we all, with unveiled faces, we can see. It says, what does it say? We're beholding, beholding, powerful word, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. And that word Lord there applies to Jesus in the context specifically. So we're beholding, pausing, gazing, consumed with the glory of the Lord Jesus. Something happens automatically, the Bible says. We're transformed into that same image from glory to glory even by the Spirit, who is the Lord. It's one of the Holy Spirit's many works that he does. He changes us to be like Christ. And the Bible, my Bible, says that all things are working together for that one purpose, to make us like Christ. We always quote that verse, Romans 8, 28. For we know... We're sure that God causes all things to work together for good. Man, it doesn't look feel too good when I'm gazing upon my sister there in the coffin a couple of weeks ago, seeing all her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren weeping, and missing her, and many of them lost themselves. Still, you can keep them in prayer. My sister's saved. She's with the Lord. All things work together for good? She was only 71. I know that's old to some people. That's very young to some people, including myself. I'm right on her heels. But the good there, the next verse in Romans 8 says that those whom God foreknew, he knew us in eternity past intimately. He predestined us. He set the GPS for all those that were going to be saved. He set the GPS. You know what the final destination is? The image of of Christ. All things working together for good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. Just continuing quoting the sentence, because those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his only begotten son. Why? It's not finished yet. It's not even for our benefit as the primary goal so that he, his only son, might be the prototokos, is the word in the Greek, the preeminent one, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. One day we're going to sit and it won't be me or some other preacher up here. It's going to be the Lord Jesus. <laughs> wow. And many of us still grieve. We know loved ones have passed and they're with the Lord now. One day we'll all be resurrected at the rapture. They'll get their new bodies first. The dead in Christ rise first. <clears throat> then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. With them. To be with the Lord. Forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Thank you, Lord. We call you Abba, Papa, Daddy, yeah, just holy God to be feared for sure. And yet we can call you Abba. We do call you Abba. You're not giving us a spirit of fear or a spirit of slavery. but We cry out Abba as your adopted children. And Jesus, you told us that uh, you wanted us to be one so the world would know that the Father sent you, and the world would know that you love us even as you love, even as the Father loves you, Lord Jesus. Wow. We all would say amen. We don't deserve that, Lord. But you chose us. You saved us. You brought us unto yourself. And we just sit in ecstasy 
And this is just the down payment your word tells us, Lord. Truly, we have a living hope to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. Whew. Wow. Kept, kept, reserved for us in heaven. And we are kept by the power of God for that salvation, ready to be revealed in the last days. Lord, we don't know. Maybe before this gathering is finished tonight, we'll hear that trumpet and you'll descend in the clouds and we'll be with you forever. Lord, thank you for your spirit. We know many are praying for this gathering, even tonight around the world, Lord, praying for this time together. We pray that you'd be glorified and minister to us through your living eternal word in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for praying for me and my family. Uh, my sister is with the Lord, as I shared with you a few weeks ago, she passed away. She has three children, uh, five living grandchildren, two are already in glory, and uh, five great grandchildren, I believe. And only her one daughter and the daughter's husband are saved. So please pray for Linda's family. Appreciate that. So we've passed out a gospel of John. The brothers were passing out a gospel of John, that little blue book right there. And inside the gospel of John is a gospel tract, which is a simple presentation of the verses from the word of God about the gospel. And the word gospel simply means good news. And as we shared with the young people yesterday, the good news is you can be saved from the bad news. The bad news is that we all stand condemned. And surely you might not be as bad as I was. I used to sell drugs and all kinds of bad stuff like that. Maybe you never did that, but all of us fall short of what? The glory of God. And just in case, just a quick little test here. Let's find out how good we really are. Question, how many lies have you ever told? Can't count that high. Most of us, right? Even the young boy back there. Yeah, we've all told lies. So as a good evangelist friend of mine says, so what does that make you? Somebody who tells lies. A liar, right? All liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. To some of us, it might sound unfair. That's, I mean, come on. You mean just because I told lies, it was as a, I was a little boy. I'm trying not to lie anymore. But we don't understand how holy God is. And we're going to meet him. We're going to meet him. Death is such a powerful preacher. And we've all gone to funerals and we can all think of loved ones right now. I'm sure that we've lost. And one day that's going to be us has to happen. It will happen apart from the rapture, which we're all hoping and waiting for. Then we don't have to die. We just immediately go to be with the Lord. But the reality of it is there is sin in us. There's sin in the world. Not only does God allow us, our bodies to be, we have to die because of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the whole universe is one day going to be destroyed. Second Peter chapter three, all the heavens and the earth will be burned up with fire. Wow. Because everything, sin tainted, has tainted everything of God's wonderful creation. But praise God, then the, the hope in that same passage in Second Peter says, but we, but we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth. And I love this, where righteousness dwells. The verb tense there is permanently permanently when the Lord finally comes for us, takes us home, pours out his wrath for seven years on the earth. We get married with the Lord Jesus forever. His bride his chosen ones and all the old Testament saints to join us, to be together with our Lord, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll come back with him. It says at the end of the tribulation, for a thousand years to rule and reign on this earth before he destroys it. But he lifts the curse. The lion will lie down with the lamb. Can't wait for that. 
I don't know about you, but I'm afraid of lions right now. One day I won't be. We're going to get to enjoy the same kind of creation that Adam and Eve had before they fell into sin. But it'll be much better because the Lord Jesus will be ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. We're going to visit back and forth and be ruling and reigning with him. I don't know all that entails, but I just know it's going to be pretty awesome. We'll have our new bodies. Not only physically will be be great, but internally, no more temptations. I'll be loving you and serving you the same way that Jesus loves us and served us completely selflessly. And you'll be doing the same to me. Wow. <laughs> that, what a gift. The end of the thousand years, make the story a little bit shorter here. The Lord then uh, he releases, releases Satan and then fire comes down and destroys all the enemies that are still left. Satan's cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 10. Then the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are also. That's the Antichrist and the right-hand man, the, his false prophet, his, his sidekick. They've already been there through that whole thousand years. They were cast in alive. But the devil will be cast in together with them, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that's wow. Five verses later in the same chapter, 2015 of Revelation, whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I understand what people say when they say, you know, God doesn't send anybody to hell. They choose to go there themselves. There's truth in that. But that verse that I just quoted, it's really going to be God Almighty. He's the final perfect judge. He's given you every opportunity multitudes of opportunities, starting with creation and conscience. You receive that, he'll give you the rest of the story, the gospel. You receive the gospel, you're his child forever, you're redeemed, you're saved from the curse of the law. You're saved from that lake of fire. And if you're really saved from the lake of fire and you somewhat comprehend that, that you did deserve that, and that the Lord Jesus did it all, you didn't do anything adding to the equation except sin, that's all we bring to the table. That's all we can offer the Lord, right? I love that song, Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. That's my only hope is what he did, the person of Christ on the cross. And if we comprehend that to some degree, we'll never fully understand that. We are going to want to tell a world that's lost and dying because at salvation, we know the Holy Spirit is given to us. That's the great promise of the Old Testament. The new covenant, Ezekiel 36. God's going to give us a new heart, heart of flesh, not of stone. He's going to give us a new spirit, my spirit, he says, so that we'll obey him. So, the word of God is a sword, right? It's living, it's powerful. It convicts us, profitable for reproof correction, training in righteousness so the men and women of God can be completely adequately equipped for every good work. So tonight we're going to look at some of the scriptures. And to be honest with you, just make sure you understand that I don't fulfill these. I'm not standing up here saying that I'm doing it and you're not. But the word of God is eternity. Remember the last time you were stood in front of that coffin and looked at your loved one. And this is the passage we're going to look at in just a moment. But I'd like to read a couple short verses of the song we just sang a little while ago. It's my heart's desire that, because it's God's desire, it's not my heart's desire, it's his, that we would repent and come back to our first love, him. Revelation chapter 2, the first church that Jesus brings up is the church at Ephesus. And if you read the passage there, it sounds like the perfect church. They're getting rid of false teaching. They're persevering under trials and persecution. They're faithful, 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 faithful. Then Jesus says this, but I have against you. Our English Bible say, I have this against you. That word's not even in the scriptures. I have against you. What? What, Lord? You have left your first love. Could it be that that's true of you and me? We've heard the message so many times. I'm not the first person who stood up in front of this platform for years. 
many of you were saved as little children and now you're older like me and and yet we've left our first love. I'm convinced that's what the church today in the West, at least, meaning us here in America, where there's wealth and freedom, that's what's happened to us. In the last church in the book of Revelation, right? The church that's lukewarm. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. I'd rather you were cold and just didn't come to church, didn't come and pray and didn't come and say that you're a fine Christian, or I'd rather it's your hot, but because you're lukewarm, what does he say? Blech. I hate to be graphic, but that's what the word says. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. Could it be that that's me tonight or you tonight? I think all of us have a little bit of that lukewarmness. And, and that's why we gave you the gospel of John. The Christian group who prints those is called Pocket Testament League. Anybody like chocolate? Anybody ever hear of Cadbury chocolate? That's a pretty good one. Mr. Cadbury was a believer. His young daughter was in high school. She was a believer. And she, they used to wear long skirts and dresses back then. This is late 1800s. And I was going to say America. I'm not even sure if it's America, I think, or England, probably. One of the two. And uh, she had a burden to reach the lost. So she's giving out. She would get Gospels of John and Gospel tracts and give them out. And she had some Christian friends, sisters with her. And they were faithful following Jesus. What happens when you follow Jesus? He said, I'll make you become fishers of people. So they must have been following. And she had an idea one day. She says, why don't we sew pockets on our dresses so we can carry these things? Pocket Testament League. So that's where they get their name. But their little catchphrases, read, carry, and share. All they do is print Gospels of John. That's all they do. All the different languages, get them in Malayalam and all the number of Indian languages. And, um, and they just a tremendous group of, of Christian people. They don't even have pay money to rent a building for their office. They just do it all via the technology, uh, phones and things like that now, the different groups that are working. They have a place where they're printing it at, but the leadership and organizing and all that, because they don't want to waste any money that comes in. And um, I really appreciate this group. It's a great little gospel book that you can go online. Uh, the church, I believe, is going to continue to do that. That's what we went out with this morning and this afternoon. We went out with Gospels of John. This particular, They have different covers I like this one. It says hope, finding hope. I don't find hardly anybody, a few people maybe. Can I give you some hope? If that's all I do, give you a quick testimony to help with your appetite of what you can do if you just do it, right? And I was in uh, back in Cleveland during uh, this couple of weeks when I went home for my sister's funeral. And I was in a Taco Bell that I used to go to frequent once in a while when I was in the area, but I haven't been there for a couple of years. For a couple, couple of years, I haven't been there. And I just went there. And there was a customer in front of me. And she was pretty distraught. Uh, average looking American lady. Tattoos. And I uh, just has I need hope written all over her. <laughs> and uh, not just because of the tattoos. But she was distraught. You could tell. And her order wasn't right. She wasn't violently angry or anything. She, I was, she was kind of polite, actually. But she was distraught and very nervous and just, oh, and then he brought it back. Oh, it's still and this and this and that. And I'm just standing there. She turned and then she saw me. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. Take your time. Take your time. And I always, guess what? Read, carry, and I want to share. So when she was done, she's, she's kind of still waiting as they're finishing up. And she was apologizing and says, that's okay. Don't worry. I reached in my pocket. I says, can I give you some hope? She paused and she just looked at me. She got teary eyed almost immediately. This just happened a week or two ago. Just one example. And she said something, I can't remember exactly who it was. It was a, one of her parents and one of her siblings had just recently died. I didn't know that. I hadn't been that place for two years and I told her that. And I explained, you know, that God loves you. And this is the gospel of John right from the Bible. And you can go from there if that's all you say. I've done that too many times. Just kind of give you some hope. They take it. Praise the Lord. The gospel of John was written so people could get saved. It says that in chapter 20, the last verse there. It says, Jesus did many other signs, right, that aren't written in this book of John. But these seven miracles are written so that you would believe that he's the Christ, the Son of God, by believing have life in his name. 
And here we sit, spiritually constipated, spiritually fat and sassy. I'm not, not trying to be funny. I'm not, just, isn't it true about us, right? We have so much of the word. Listen to me. I'm just, I can share. I know the scriptures. You know the scriptures. And yes, we're to, to come together, to equip each other, to minister to one another for one purpose. For one purpose. Why did Jesus come to the earth? This is response time. Somebody, go ahead. Anybody, why did Jesus come to the earth? To save us? I'm sorry. Yeah, to save us from our sins. Christ came into the world to save sinners, right? There's another verse. Christ Jesus came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. We're going to look at a verse today that you might not have thought of. And um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And while you're turning there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We sang a couple moments ago these verses. The last two verses of trust and obey. I like that. I was just thinking while we sang that. It's interesting because that's the correct order. We trust him first. Then we obey him. And because we trust him, we obey him. He tells me to get baptized after I get saved. I get baptized. He could have told me to do something else. But hopefully that's what I want to do because I love him. Here's the song, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. And I was watching, I'm not trying to be, I'm not condemning or being overly critical because I'm as guilty as anybody here, but we just sing those words. We know them, we memorize them. Wow. Till all on the altar we lay. So the, the, the assembly and the brothers here have wanted me to come and share about sharing the gospel and also to sh myself as I'm sharing now to share the gospel. Number one, we have to lay it all on the altar. It's not going to go any further than, than this. Just a few beautiful Indian people coming together, breaking bread together, which is awesome. I'm not demeaning any of that. But there's a whole world, his brother said, boy, you want to have your heart broken, just come down, take a walk on the boardwalk. Don't even have to witness, just look. Standing on the boardwalk as far as you can look up north, as far as you can see going down south. And it's long, I mean, because it's in Hollywood there, it just seems to go on. Just a zillion people. Not a guilt trip, but the Lord talks about this all the time, right? When he just got done with the woman at the well and she left and went back in the city. He says, look, the fields are white, here they come. One woman, she was only saved for moments, hour, half an hour, however long it took her to go in. She starts going and telling everybody. The men, it says, interesting. <laughs> she went and told all the men. I met a man. He told me everything I ever did. I wonder if the men were convicted, right? Because she was an immoral woman. Five husbands living with a guy now. Couldn't this be? This must be. This got to be the Messiah. Come and see. That's all, that's all we're commanded to do, to let our light shine. We never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. And I want to encourage this assembly. We had, I was Overwhelmed with joy. Six young men came out today. Everybody's young to me. So but there were some teenagers among us. And six of these guys come out and they wanted, they're all knocking their knees, not knowing what to do, what to say. And I says, good. It's just like me. <laughs> and we prayed and we gave a little practical steps and just trying to hand out the gospels of John and the gospel track inside that you have. And some people took them and a couple of us had some smaller conversations. I, I told the, 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 the brothers it'd be better probably, I found, if we go a little later in the day, like as the sun's kind of going down, five, six o'clock, people are more relaxed. They're just kind of walking up and down. And I've seen that you get more conversations. 
And it's not just all about going to the boardwalk. That's one way. And it's encouraging. If I can go and do that, I can talk to my workmate that I've been praying for. Oh, he knows I'm a Christian. He knows where I stand. Have you shared Jesus with them? And we're going to uh, encourage us just to be able to at least give gospel literature. Gospel literature meaning uh, written Bible verses, either the Gospel of John or Romans or some other port or a whole Bible or a New Testament or gospel tracts. It's not how everybody gets saved. Many people get saved by hearing, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. I got saved by reading one gospel tract. So I know that it works. 37 years ago, I don't even know who gave it to me. My testimony, somebody put it in a sealed envelope, laid it on the bar where I was singing in the nightclubs, and the bartender gave it to me. Who's this from? I don't know. It's for you. It's got your name written on it. Sealed envelope. I don't even know to this day who gave it to me. It was that gospel track. That person had no idea that if I wasn't afraid of hell, I would have committed suicide. I was so laughing on the outside, singing, but crying out for help from God on the inside. And God sent somebody, somebody that was too shy maybe to come up face to face, but they at least gave me, they knew I needed Jesus and they obeyed, they trusted and obeyed the Lord. And you can do that. Every one of us can do that if we know the Lord. The last verse says, then in fellowship, sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do. We just sang that. Really? Again, I'm not trying to be I play the whole, I'm not the Holy Spirit, obviously, but conviction, right? For me, what he says we will do. Well, he came to save others. He says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Follow me. Follow me, Jesus says. Follow me. He came to the different fishermen. What did they do? They left their nets. John and James, the two brothers, left their father and the servants. They had a good business, left it all. Jesus said, follow me, and what's going to happen? I will make you become fishers of men, but you got to follow me. Got to follow me. I'm, I'm sorry, I asked you to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians. There was a, yeah, but just before that, I'm sorry, if you'll hold your place, because that's our main passage tonight, but let's look at Jer Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Starting in verse 11, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet for a number of reasons. Uh, he lived and saw the judgment of God upon God's people. He saw the terrible atrocities of uh, parents, actually, because the enemy, the Babylonians, surrounded Jerusalem starved them out literally for a long time that they were actually eating their children. He saw when the enemies broke through the walls and they came in, they killed with the sword and they burned. And the Bible tells us some gory details, which I won't even mention right now, what, what they did to the pregnant women and the babies inside. Horrible. He saw this. He lived through it. He had been preaching, warning that this is going to happen unless the nation repents. And fellow Americans, that's where we live right now, right? So wherever our, I'm not, I was born in America. Some of you were born here in America. Some of you were born in India, but we we're just all visiting this place, right? My ancestry is over in Europe somewhere. But this is where God has planted us for now. And we know we're in grave danger with the Lord. Still, every day, the average is 3,000 babies being murdered, thrown into black garbage bags, taken to the garbage dump, and bulldozers covering them over with dirt. 3,000 every day. It's one of the sins recorded, two sins God held Israel accountable for, why, he said, why God said he did what he did. Shedding of innocent blood, which was their babies, if you read through the story. And they worshipped idols. Look at what Jeremiah says. Chapter 2, verse 11. Has a nation changed gods, small gods? Because the other nations, they all worship 
false gods, multiple gods. As Indian folks, you know about that. I've been to India 12 times, so a little bit familiar. Have they changed gods? No. They stay with their false gods. They don't jump around and switch to this and this and that, right? And Hinduism includes multitudes and the other ones who worship a few idols, they, they don't jump. They stay as a nation changed gods, and that's unheard of. When they were not real gods, of course not. But God speaking, but my people, as the believers in Jehovah, Lord God, the one true God, but my people have changed their, notice he didn't say God there, he says their glory. God is our glory. We've changed their glory. They did, and I, I believe we're doing the same thing here in America. But they changed their glory for that which does not profit. Then God says this, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. God's speaking to the heavens. This is incredible. Nations don't leave their false gods, but the real God, my people have left. It's it worse. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. Not only have they forsaken me, the living God. What did they replace me with, God says? Broken cisterns that don't even hold water. Cistern was a kind of a well, basically, and dug in the ground and is a broken. It doesn't hold water. And again, these are the words of God, and we all have to examine our own life. I, I'm guilty here. I'm guilty here. I mean, doesn't the New Testament say, do not love the world, nor the things in the world? Because all that's in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, I want more. Give me this, what my flesh, my sinful, selfish, physical desire desires. Give me, give me, give me and the boastful pride of life. It's not from God and is passing away. But whoever does the will of my father, of the father, he lives forever. Two evils. We've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Oh, brother stood up and both brothers who, uh, who were sharing here tonight, singing and then Joshua there, there's something about when you just, you know you can't do it. You don't want to do it, but you do it because Jesus tells you to do it. And you literally, like the Levites, like God told Joshua to tell the Levites when they first, what, put their feet in the water of the Jordan, which was overflowing. They can't walk through this. This is a flooding river, right? But God promised he Stop the water, part it. They can go through to the other side, to Jericho. But he said it wouldn't happen until what? First comes faith, then the miracle. And I don't stand here as somebody who's got this super courage or anything. Paul himself asked the churches to pray that he would have boldness. Asked that he would have open doors to preach the word. Asked that he would have the wisdom what to say. He said in Corinthians chapter in First Corinthians, I came before you with fear and trembling. He'd be standing up here, he'd be terrified to speak to the people. And, and that's okay. Because in weakness, what? In our weakness, the Lord's strength is made real, perfect. And so God is looking for some people that are really willing to humble themselves, confess their sins that we haven't been trusting and obeying, that we have done the horrible, the most appalling thing that anybody could even imagine. We've forsaken almighty God. Oh, we come to our church meetings. Oh, we break the bread. We take the Lord's Supper. And yet we're just not fully trusting and obeying him. And not just in evangelism, but I mean, we spend so much more time watching TV and the YouTube and things nowadays. It's so hard. And I'm guilty of some of these things, right? Forsaken the fountain of living waters and replaced it with stuff. And I, even worse, I would say, than broken cisterns with sinful stuff sometimes, right? So brothers and sisters, may God help us to lay it all on the altar.
First, our sins. As Christians, our sins, right? That's how you know you're a Christian, First John. One of the first signs. The first one is you're walking in the light in chapter 1. The second one is you're confessing sins. Non-Christians don't confess their sins. But how do you know a true Christian? We're constantly confessing our sins to the Lord. Confession means we're saying the same as, Lord, I agree with you. I should be giving you everything, and I give you so little. And so first comes the faith. We, we repent, we confess, and then we step out and we do whatever he tells us to do. If you're truly born, if you're not truly born again, get saved. God commands all men everywhere to repent, right? And come to the Lord. And I trust most of us here are saved. And if we are saved, then we need to be, make sure that we've been baptized as a believer. And if we've been baptized, then what? Teaching them to obey all that I command you, to love one another. Yeah, we love one another when we're together. And I praise God, we're going to get together. Well, you, you brothers are going to get together tomorrow and, and uh, see how we can help India right now. We've got, I've, I've been to India so many times, I'm still in communion with them, brothers, through the uh, technology and the phones and, and, and all that. And my goodness, this is real. I mean, there's multitudes that are dying from that virus over there. It's horrible. And some of the brothers there are crying, you know, please pray, Christian. We've, we've, we, we've gone out with our students. One, one dear brother's got a small Bible school and orphans. We're going and we, we, we give out food and, and please pray the Lord will provide more so we can go and share with some of these people and share the gospel. What am I doing? I'm worried about how I can get a new car, new house, nicer TV, all the stuff of the world. I was born in America, and some of you came here. Again, my ancestors came for the same reason. Land of prosperity, right? The American dream. That's sinful. <laughs> the American dream is sinful. It's all for the flesh. God brought you here as a missionary. God brought you here, brother, as a missionary. Yes, he did. God brings us wherever to be a missionary. To know Christ and to make him known. Let's say that together. To know Christ and to make him known. Once more. To know Christ and to make him known. That's everything in life. That's it. Just to know him. So start to read the Gospel of John. I'm giving everyone homework. I give the youth the same homework. And since you're all youth here tonight... Start to read the gospel. Oh, I've read John so many times. Read it. I'm telling you, please take up this challenge. Today is May 1st. If you're able, if not, start tomorrow. Read chapter one today, tomorrow, chapter two, etc. One chapter a day, one chapter a day. Get in an attitude of prayer and just look at the Lord Jesus. 21 chapters when you're finished, guess what? Do it again. I'm challenging you, I'm asking you, I'm begging you. Read the book of John every day this rest of this year. And again, I've read it many times, but every time I come back and just beholding Jesus Christ, he changes me. And he talks to me and he shows me him, to know him, right? Peter's last words, Peter's last words on earth that he recorded for us. But grow. In the what? Grace and knowing Christ, knowledge of Christ. Hmm. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they cut out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Second Corinthians chapter 4. How do we get to where we need to be? We need to have the correct perspective of life. Everything we're looking at right now, I'm looking at you all. You're seeing, I'm seeing a group. You're looking at me. Some of you seeing the back of heads plus me. It's all temporary. My sister, she's already in the ground. That body, flesh and blood, will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's getting eaten by worms, already beginning to decompose. That was just her little temporary car she drove around in. Just her little vessel. And that's in chapter 4, what Paul is saying. He says, we've got this treasure of the gospel in these earthen vessels or clay pots so that God gets all the glory. So six of us, and seven including myself today, went down to the beach and we all gave out a few gospel tracts at least. One of the young brothers, I won't mention his name so he didn't feel uh, whatever, embarrassed, but so precious, just melted my heart. 
he was scared, didn't know what to do, how to do. And more, and a lot of people on the beach, no, thank you. That's the worst they do to you. No, thank you. And again, if you go evening, it seems to be a little bit more receptive. Just people are on the beach. and But we have some good, good opportunities. Oh, yeah. Anyway, this young boy, he, he set a little goal. I want to give out so many of these. And uh, he said to me, he says, I came one short. But that's not the goal, but he was trusting and obeying. And God used him. It's wonderful. And God can use us. And again, it's not that everybody has to go down to the beach and the boardwalk. But we do have to share the gospel. Why wouldn't we? We talk about everything else. Right? Anybody here besides me feeling convicted? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the good news is God doesn't expect us to do it. He just wants us to trust and put our feet, and take that first little step. And again, these young men today, especially this one younger guy, that's what, man, it's so great. I wouldn't be surprised if you're going to hear great things coming out of this young man as he grows. But we have to trust and obey. That's what God says just before he was ascended. He says, no, it's not for you to know when I'm coming back. The Father said a time, but it's not for you to know. Oh, I'm coming back. I'm going to establish the kingdom, restore it to Israel. But it's not about that right now. But you shall receive power. The word is dunamis, dynamite, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. How come we don't see the power? Because we have our little 40-minute meetings, then we run off and fill our bellies, and we talk about everything except Jesus, and then we all go home. And again, I'm not saying that with any fierceness. I mean, because I'm guilty too. But we can repent. We can really start to get to, back to our first love. Don't you want that? Sure you do. And that's where the joy and the peace comes. Through the Holy Spirit, when we trust him, when we obey him, when we keep our gaze upon Jesus. Hebrews says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews says in chapter 3 or 4, I, I keep forgetting which one it is, fix your mind, your thoughts on Jesus. Paul says in Colossians, fix your mind on the things above, not on the earth. Let's read what Paul has to say. We're going to just start in verse 16 of chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, and then we'll go into chapter 5. So I'd like to just read through this and just add a few thoughts as we go. Paul had just been talking about how he's suffering and uh, because he's given up everything for Christ. In this life, he's suffering. But therefore, we do not lose heart, verse 16. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So we have an outer man that's our body, our physical, our flesh. My sister left it all behind. You take nothing with you when you die, not even your own body. You leave it all. But the real you inside, this inner man, inner woman, Paul says, being renewed day by day. Why? For the momentary light affliction. Now his light affliction is my goodness, they're not light in my book. Beaten, stoned, hungry, thirsty, naked, it says. Cold at night. Just hated by so many people. But he calls them momentary light afflictions. And they are based on his perspective. What's the perspective? And this is where we all need to repent of and get back to the eternal perspective. Because we're all headed for eternity. And just because you're younger than me doesn't mean you won't beat me there, young person, right? I watched my five-year-old nephew take his last breath. My 22-year-old nephew died of heroin overdose. Another 22-year-old nephew died before him of AIDS. People die young and old. But these momentary light afflictions, they're producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Not just the suffering that we're bringing on because we uh, get sick with cancer type things. And, but this is his sufferings for Christ, which might include being sick, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to put down uh, how important it is to, to love and be concerned about those who are sick. But it's, it, it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. There's no comparison. Ask Paul that now, right? <laughs> He's got a ton of rewards. Jesus, he's with the Lord. 
got his head chopped off, history tells us. He was beheaded. Wow. Verse 18 is very important. While we look not at the things which are seen. So there's a commitment there. There's this decision there. We've decided we're not going to look at the things which are seen. That means focus, right? We look, we see things, obviously, but we're not going to look, gaze upon the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Next sentence. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. He's talking about his body here. God calls it a tent. Paul calls it a tent. It's temporary. Tents were just temporary dwellings. If it's torn down, if we're dying, like he was talking in the last chapter, we have a building from God. Everybody dies once. Everybody, every human being gets two bodies, starting from Adam to the last person born. This one that we're in now, temporary. Adam's first body gone. He's not in a body right now. At the resurrection, the dead in Christ get their new bodies. And somewhere in there also, the Old Testament saints get their new bodies. Then we who are alive and remain, we get new bodies transformed in the twinkling of an eye, right? We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So why do we go out and witness? Why do we go out on the beach today? Man, I didn't want to go there. I am not an early morning person. Somehow I get wired. I'm I'm up late and I'm praying and reading. And man, I get up early and come over here. And I just, as I'm getting older, for some reason, I just, man, I just can't get going. And I don't drink coffee because I got saved 37 years ago. That's a joke. Yeah. Verse two, for indeed in this house, we groan. Anybody groaning? Teenagers are going, what are you old fogies talking about? This body's fine. You wait. <laughs> we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. I don't think that's just physical. I'm tormented. With, I can't wait. One of the greatest joys of heaven is going to be get rid of this sinful nature. I'm never going to be selfish anymore. No more temptation. No more sin. To be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, for indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on when we get our new bodies, will not be found naked. Meaning we're not going to just be a spirit floating around. No, we're going to have a real new body, permanent, second body. Verse 4, for indeed, while we are in this tent, here in this body, we groan, being burdened. Because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. I can't wait for my new body. No sin, no suffering, no sickness, no death. Amen? Amen? Amen. Why? Why do I not want this new body? I love this statement. Look at that. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. This is just the temporary one day we're going to wake up and have real life in a new body with the Lord forever. Wow. Verse 5. Now he, God who prepared us for this very purpose, is God. That's the whole reason he saved us. That's what it says. To give us a new body, to be with him, perfect in heaven with his son, the firstborn, we, the adopted children, forever and ever and ever who gave to us the spirit as a pledge or a down payment, a guarantee. We have the spirit. We know we're going to get a new body. Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, in other words, while we're here in this first body, we're absent from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. Anybody seen Jesus today? No, we haven't seen him. So in that sense, we're not with him, right? We know he's in our presence and that, but we're not with him yet. Verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and we prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. I wish our prayer meetings were like that. Somebody once said, and I think it's true, we spend more time praying to keep the saints out of heaven than we do to try to keep the lost out of hell. 
we, and it's not wrong to pray for people who are sick. When I'm sick, you get my text. I want you to pray for me. When my sister was sick, please pray for me. That's good. But we need to be praying. The reason we don't have this burden for soul, Paul prayed for three things, asking the churches to pray. B-O-W, boldness, open doors, opportunities, wisdom, what to say. We have not because we ask not. I guarantee you start asking God with a sincere heart, God, give me boldness, courage, so I can go out and talk to somebody and give them a gospel of John or talk to, tell them about Jesus. He'll give you that. Give me an open door where I should talk. Who? Lord, lead. Give me wisdom what to say. I don't know what to say. Paul wanted people to pray that for him. Being of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in the Lord, in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're a good courage, I say, prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. May that become true in my life. I really, more than anything, nothing here keeps me hanging on. I'd rather be with the Lord in heaven. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home, meaning here in this life, or absent when I'm with the Lord, our goal our desire, our ambition is to be pleasing to him. This is what I was sharing with the young men today. You know, while we were out there, as much as we didn't want to be in the, in the heat and, and just go home and relax in, in a flesh, that was our thoughts. I said, but the Lord is looking down from heaven. He's pleased with us. And we're obeying him when we're trusting him. And again, it doesn't mean you have to go down to the beach, but in any way that we're trying to follow him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I think most of us know there's two judgment seats. One is for the unsaved. It's called the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20. Whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's only for unbelievers. Jesus is going to bring the unbelievers to himself and show them their deeds in the book. These are all the evil deeds that you did you rejected me look at the word of the book of life your name's not here because you rejected you could have been forgiven of all this you chose not to be depart from me i never knew you if you're born again you won't be at that judgment but there is a judgment seat that we will be at the bema seat and this is where we get our rewards or our ashes Somebody once said, because he's going to judge our works, not our life. We're, we're, in, we're in glory, but we get judged for the things we've done since we've been Christians. What we did for Christ and through the power of Christ, we get a reward. I'm not sure all that that is. There's crowns. We could go in and study that later. But, but he says he judges it with fire, wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. What does fire do to wood, hay, and stubble? Ashes. Wow. Somebody says, I, I don't want to be standing knee deep in ashes when I meet the Lord. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What's Paul's response when he thinks about that thought? Therefore, knowing the fear or the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Wow. Brothers and sisters, Jesus said, we're going to look at this tomorrow. We're almost done here. Give me just a couple more minutes. We're going to look at where he said, follow me. I'll make you become fishers of men. Become. I'm going to make you a fisher. We don't know how to fish for men. But as we surrender, lay it all to the Lord. Lord, I want to follow you. And it's not too late for any of us. I'm 65 and some of you are a little bit older. And you might be thinking, well, you can't go down to the beach. You don't have to. But you can pray for lost souls. You can pray for yourself, for God to give you an opportunity. I guarantee you, I, can, I guess I can almost guarantee you, if you pray, in the morning, sincerely, Lord, today, give me an opportunity to share you with somebody. You think he's not going to answer that? Sure he will. Sure he will. He'll give you the boldness if you ask, too. He'll give you the words to say if you ask, too. But we need to be asking for the right things. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Then he goes into a little bit of argument there, defending his apostleship. We're going to skip over that just for a moment. Uh, we'll go to verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us or constrains us. Why do we go and share the gospel with people? Why do I want to talk to my neighbor? Why am I carrying gospels of John in my pocket when it disrupts the way I sit? I can't sit comfortably all the time. Because Jesus' love for me constrains me and my love back to him, the love of Christ. I believe it's his love for me. I just, I just 
want to do what he wants me to do. And I don't all the time. Who suffers? Him? No. Me. I don't have his joy and his peace and his all the fruit of the spirit, but I could. Hmm. For the love of Christ constrains us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Christ died for all. And all the Christians, the Bible says, we died with him on the cross. Look at verse 15. Here's another reason why Jesus died. This is powerful. Powerful. He died for all. Why? So that they who live might no longer live unto themselves, but unto him who died and rose again for them. Wow. Wow. That's why he died. To make us like him. He never lived for himself, did he? Not once. Our God is humble. That's just mind-boggling, right? Because humility doesn't, I mean, God should be, no, Jesus humbled himself, whatever you say, Father. Is there another way? Take this cup of wrath. I'm going to have to drink the wrath of God tomorrow on the cross. You're going to punish me. You're going to crush me, condemn me, curse me. Three words used in the New Testament that happened to Jesus by the Father. Crushed, Isaiah 53. Condemned, cursed for my sin. Jesus says, I'll, I'll do it. Your will, not mine. That's the image he's trying to make us to. Now, our flesh fights that. I don't want that. I want to do what I want to do. Look in the mirror. Ask yourself, how's that working out? God has so much more for us, brothers and sisters. If we get back to our first love, him. For the love of Christ control, constrains us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all in order that they who live should no longer live for themselves. There's a the negative. We're not going to live for ourselves by choice, but we're choosing to live for Jesus who died and rose again on our behalf. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. I don't look at people just as a human being and what I can get from them and what they can do, what I can do for them in the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Paul says, that's how I used to think of Christ, just the man that was on earth. Yet, no, yet now we know him in this way no longer. That's what that's talking about. We don't look, and this is where this verse 17 that we all know, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's what? New creation. It means we look at people differently. That's what the text says. Now we look at people differently. Why? Because the whole passage is we're looking at life differently. From an eternal perspective, we're going to be there soon and very soon, either by death or the rapture. All the prophecies have been fulfilled. Nothing has to be fulfilled. Christ could come at any moment. I'm convinced he's coming in my generation real soon. Eternal perspective. We don't look at people the same anymore. Well, it's not just my boss. It's not just my family members. It's not just my neighbor. No, it's a lost soul. There's a soul inside that shell of that person, that body. And Christ gave his life for that person, just like he gave his life for me. So now we're viewing life differently from eternal perspective. We're looking at people, especially differently. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all things, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Reconcile means the two parties that once were at war brought together in peace. And Christ did that, right? When he died on the cross, God is no longer... Angry with us? He, Christ took the wrath of God. We're no longer God's enemy. We're his friend. We're his children. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That he would choose us to be involved in his work. You, if you're a believer in Christ, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation, which means what? We bring people to Christ. We don't convert them, but just like Andrew brought his brother, Simon, to Christ. We talk about, we tell them, we show them, bring, introduce them to Jesus Christ. He's the one who can reconcile. That's what he says. And we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Incredible. Verse 19, namely, 
what's this ministry all about? All we do is tell people that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God wants to make you his friend, his child, not his enemy. And the gospel track, so I would, I, I'm asking you to read the gospel of John every day. I'm asking you to read that gospel pamphlet once a day the rest of this year. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God will help you have a greater understanding of the gospel yourself and how to share it with others. And men and women, God wants to reconcile. God who is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He takes their sin away, right? Because Christ paid for them. And he is committed to you and to me, the word or the message of reconciliation. So we've been given the ministry to reconcile lost souls, enemies of God, to a holy God who hates their sin but loves them, gave his only son to die on the cross so they could be forgiven, their sins, trespasses removed from them. We have the greatest privilege in the world. And most churches, most Christians, and again, I'm not, I'm including myself, we, we're not even aiming at the right target as we ought. In the last verse, so what is this message of reconciliation? God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who can understand what was going on at that time? Isaiah 53 says he was pierced through for our transgressions. Who pierced him through, man or God? Man drove the nails into his hands. Next sentence says he was crushed for our iniquities. Who crushed him? It says his bones weren't broken. God crushed him for our iniquities. It pleased, later on in the same passage, it pleased the Lord Almighty to crush him. It satisfied God to crush Jesus. Jesus took all the wrath of God that you and I should take. And every sinner that would believe, he took that. He cries out, it's finished, it's paid in full. Now he's given us the privilege, the ministry to be involved. He's the head, we're just the body. He'll lead you, he'll put the words in your mouth if you really lay it all on the altar. Will you do that tonight? We're gonna just pause for some prayer. Why did God give his son? That we would no longer live for ourselves, but unto him, Christ, who gave himself for us. What's the message of reconciliation? God made him who knew no sin, so that if anyone would repent and believe in him, what do we become? The righteousness of God in Christ. You're looking at the righteousness of God. And I know I ain't worthy. And I know I still sin every day. But God, that's how he sees it. That's the Bible says, I am. It says that they would become the righteousness of God in Christ. We had a nice little illustration yesterday, the righteousness of Christ. We had a nice clean white shirt and we had a, a, a dark vest and the sin was placed on Christ and he died and God takes that sin and throws it behind his back. And then when the believe, when a person repents and believes on Christ, God places his righteousness, this, this white, beautiful clean, pure robe, spotless, blameless, places it on me. Never to be taken off. That's how we get to heaven. That's how much God loves us. Let's take some time to pray. I'm just going to let us remain silent. Don't go, to, don't go to sleep. I know we're a little bit tired. I've gone over a few minutes. And um, let's take a few moments to pray to Jesus about what God has spoken to your heart tonight. Ask him, Lord, I'm sorry. Wash me clean. I confess. I want to follow you. Make me a fisher of men. Show me how. Show me who. I'm offering myself back to you because you gave your life for me. Let's just take some time to silent prayer, then I'll close.
Take my life, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Make my life a living sacrifice, knowing it's the least that I can do. Make that your prayer. Sing it to the Lord with me. Take my life. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Make my life a living sacrifice. I know that it's the least that I can do. Lord Jesus, truly you are worthy of it all. Lord, I say, when I look at my own life, you are worth so much more. Lord, please forgive me and cleanse me. Lord, you know I spoke the words today and how often I don't live them myself. Lord, but let God be true and every man a liar. You have spoken tonight, Lord. Minister to us. Help us to see your beauty, your glory your awesome love for us, that you would give your only son, Father. Your awesome love, Father, that you would pour out all the wrath that I deserve upon him, your holy, beautiful son. And you even said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But Lord, you cursed him, you condemned him, you crushed him for me. Help me to, by your spirit, let go of my life and follow you with all my heart. Lord, we love you because you first love us. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done. Lord, you were never not willing to come and do that for, to obey your Father and to love us. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. Jesus, you alone are worthy. You are Lord, Jesus, you are Lord. You have risen from the dead and you are Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Please take up my challenge for the homework. Start to read John again and just look at Jesus. Let him Help us get to know him more and more and more. And automatically we're going to be with people and he's just going to flow out of us. And the gospel track inside the same. Please read that every day. It'll really help us. Turn it back over to uh, brother, somebody give us the prayer or the directions. Thank you very much.